Hello, hello, hello. Please, please have a seat. Welcome, everyone. Jill and I are truly honored to host uh, for our uh, some of our most favorite events here in the White House. This is this ranks right up there. And special thanks to our friend David Rubenstein. David, you become a friend. <laughs> David. David is chairman, chairman of the board of the Kennedy Center and probably puts more time in there than he does his business. But thank you, David, for all you do. And uh, president of the Kennedy Center, Deborah Rudder. Deborah, raise your hand. Let people see you. Now. And to all of you, supporters of the arts and families and friends of this year's honorees, you know, this reception is a fitting way to cap what has been a special week. On Monday, Jill unveiled the theme of this year's holiday at the White House. The theme that's reflected in the incredible decor that you see in every room that's grounded in the very idea of America. We, the people. We, the people. The first words of the Constitution. The beating heart of our democracy. The story of our nation that makes America, America. The power of democracy is something I talked about a few days before uh, when President Macron was here and uh, the President of France, who we hosted in our first state visit. France, our oldest ally. We talked about the inflection point we face as free nations and how the choices we make in today and the next several months or the next years as well are going to determine the future for decades to come. Dealing with everything from an unjust war in Ukraine to climate crisis to the global economy on the move, but we shared confidence and optimism that we'll meet this moment because of our faith in we, the people. And that's the truth. And at our state dinner, Jill and I ask an artist to capture the faith only an artist can do. John Batiste was our guest, the son of a famed <laughs> the son of a famed New Orleans family, jazz musicians, and civil rights leaders. An Oscar and Grammy winner, he sang a song called Freedom and spoke about the power of art that brings people together despite our differences. To see each other, to see ourselves in one another, to unite in common cause. Tonight, we celebrate a truly exceptional, and this is no, that's not an exaggeration, a truly exceptional group of artists. Group of artists. We embody the very spirit of we the people. At this year's Kennedy Center honorees, they're all an incredible group of people. And we the people, we see character. We see Amal Clooney's husband. <laughs> George is one of the most celebrated actors, directors, producers, and screenwriters of our time. Two Academy Awards. One of only three people nominated in six different categories. A, uh, you know, uh, he portrays iconic characters. An heroic doctor, daring astronaut, a wisecracking con man. The list goes on. I res one thing I respect most about George, and I mean this sincerely, is his deep empathy. He's never forgotten before the fame back home what it was like back in Kentucky and Ohio as a kid. A kid with dyslexia. College dropout figuring out life. After missing his dream of playing baseball for the Cincinnati Reds, you think he's a joke, I'm not joking. He chases a new dream in Hollywood, working on a tobacco farm to earn some scratch, sleeping in his friend's closet with nowhere to go until he finally gets his break. No matter where he is or what he does, he always remembers where he came from. You know, he's a son of Nick and Nina. Both of them are here tonight. Nick and Nina, raise your hand, please. <laughs> Dad is a reporter and mom a councilwoman, but mom looks more like uh, his sister. Uh, <laughs> They taught George and his big sister that the life spent challenging the powerful on behalf of the powerless is a life of purpose. He travels to war zones to end genocides and war crimes, exposes war profiteers, helps refugees and advances the rights of journalists, raises millions of dollars to support 9-11 first responders, victims of national disaster, and advocates 
and advocates who, along with him, are combating hate. Mentors, he mentors these, those historic kids from Parkland on their march and their lives against gun violence. I met with every one of those kids, and they really appreciated what you did, George. Not a joke. He knows that work remains unfinished. Yet, he is unrelenting and undaunted. That's character in real life, and that's George Clooney. people, we see faith and light. We see Amy Grant, a child of Nashville. <laughs> child of Nashville, sitting in the front pew of church with her great-grandmother, singing hymns and learning harmony. With her parents' love, she recorded her first album while she was still in high school. The start of more than three-decade career and still counting. It established a contemporary Christian music as we know it today. Six Grammys, six Grammys, 19 nominations. The first contemporary Christian artist to be number one on the pop charts. And her Christian songs are played on repeat in millions of homes across America. Like the, like the greatest, she has, uh, she, I, I, I can't get over you, quite frankly. <laughs> like the greatest do, she writes songs from her soul about joy, about loss, about healing, about how others feel and how you make people feel when you sing. I really mean it. She does more than that. Everywhere you turn in Nashville, you see Amy's Fellowship, established musical therapy at a children's hospital for veterans struggling with the wounds of war, playing benefit concerts for a long list of worthy causes. Amy calls music a soul enlarging experience. In my church, St. Augustine said it slightly differently. He said, singing is praying twice. Singing is praying twice. You understand when you hear Amy Grant sings, her voice, her voice is a true gift of God, and she shares with everyone, especially with her incredible family, including her husband, Vince Gill, who can, has a pretty damn good voice himself. <laughs> Amy, thank you for always keeping the faith. Every time I'd walk out of my grandpa Finnegan's house in Scranton, he'd yell, Joey, keep the faith. My grandma would yell, no, Joey, spread it. You spread it. Thank you. <laughs> we, the people, we also hear goodness and grace of the one and only expressive soul, Gladys Knight. God bless you. Daughter of Atlanta, who grew up in a church choir, began performing with her brother, sister, and cousins, a group that became known as Gladys Knight and the Pips. You're on my recording. <laughs> After over six decades, seven Grammys, 20 nominations, including the best gospel album, 11 number one R&B singles, singles, six number one R&B albums, two number one top Billboard hits, Granny, Grammy Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame. She's performing on the biggest stages, but, but a point of personal privilege. I think her performance in 1919 at the 100th anniversary of the Delaware State Fair was pretty special. <laughs> <laughs> They're still talking about it, Gladys. Not, 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 not a joke. Not a joke. And down at the fair, they speak like y'all do down in Atlanta. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just a few days ago, we observed World AIDS Day much different day than during the worst of the epidemic in the 80s. Back then, Gladys joined Elton John, Stevie Wonder, Dionne Warwick, and the benefit to, and in benefit record to sing, that's what friends are for. You reach number one in the charts, shattering the stigma and opening hearts. The title of her autobiography is, You Were There Between Each Line of My Pain and Glory. Gladys, your voice, your voice has spoken to what breaks our hearts, what tears us apart, what lifts our spirits, what brings us together, what makes us human. Gladys, you're truly one of the best things ever happened to any of us. <laughs> so 
So if you don't mind me saying it, we're going to get on that midnight train because I think <laughs> I speak for all America. I say we'd rather live in your world than be without you and ours. <laughs> I told her I think I have about every one of her songs on my phone. But uh, because I remember them. She was only 12 when she was making them. But, uh, and we, the people, we also hear courage and creativity. We hear Tanya Leon, born and raised in a working class Havana, surrounded by the varied sounds of Cuba and the fusion of cultures and music. A young child who danced to the radio not long after she learned to walk. At age four, her grandmother enrolled her in a music conservatory. She trained into her 20s to be a classical piano player and broadened a, and boarded a freedom flight in Miami in the wake of the Cuban Revolution, just days later landed in New York City. Over the next six decades, she became one of the most important classical composers and conductors of our time. During the Civil Rights Movement, she co-founded the Dance Theater in Harlem, the country's first black classical ballet company. She also conducted the world-renowned New York Philharmonic and worked with the Brooklyn Philharmonic to bring classical music beyond concert halls into city neighborhoods. She led symphonies in South Africa to, from South Africa to Germany. A mentor and a professor, she champions new composers, earning dozens of honors. Her versatility, her vision, her defying labels, her deepening Latin American influence in classical music. It was President Kennedy who laid the groundwork for the freedom flights that brought Tiana to America. 55 years later, she now receives the Kennedy Center honors. And we thank her, thank her for breathing new sounds into the soul of the nation. We, the people, we hear the words of uh, one of my favorite poets of all times. My, my colleagues up in the United States Senate used to kid me because I was quoting Irish poets on the floor. They thought I did it because I was Irish. That's not the reason. I did it because they're the best poets in the world. <laughs> but we hear the words of Yeats. He said, think where man's glory most begins and ends, and say, my glory was I had such friends. Words that echo from an island close to my heart as a descendant of County Mayo and County Louth. Tonight, we honor our four sons of Ireland, poets in their own right, best friends who started a band as teenagers in Dublin and became one of the greatest bands in history. Larry, Adam, The Edge, Bono, Mutual. Mutual. The heritage of the Irish traditions of poetry and protest, rebellion and rejoicing, faith, hope and love, and a belief in the dignity of all people everywhere. Dignity is a very important word to them all. And to quote my friend Bono, music can change the world because it can change people. For more than 40 years, U2 has changed the world. Anthems about civil rights, solidarity of workers, a struggle for peace, ballads about love and family. Concerts dedicated to ending poverty and disease. 22 Grammys, 46 nominations. More wins than any group in history. 150 million albums. <laughs> 150 albums sold among the most ever. And it's true that their music is a bridge between Ireland and America, between two friends, linked in memory and imagination joined by our history, and joined by a nostalgia for the future. I, they, you know, they put down the things, the original quotes of, of, of presidents and senators. The only one they have listed for me is, and it really is something that I realize I got from my family, is the Irish are the only people in the world who are always nostalgic about the future. <laughs> the future. <laughs> but it's more than that. More universal, more fundamental, and more important than ever. From Sunday, Bloody Sunday, to pride in the name of love, 
to ordinary love, to one, the U2 has spoken and sung about the unspeakable cost of hate and anger and division, the pain, the suffering, the denial of freedom, the senseless loss of life, and the inhumanity we inflict on one another as nations, as people, and in our own lives. All flowing from division that for all of us is visible, manifestations lie first and foremost in our hearts. Just before America's bloody and deadly civil war, President Lincoln wrote, we are not enemies. We must not be enemies. In the midst of the great division that was President Lincoln's plea, he would, we would do well to remember today at a moment when there's too much hate, too much anger, too much division here in America and quite frankly around the world. We have to remember today, as our song goes, we are one, but we're not the same. We get to carry each other. From this Irish-American president in the White House designed by Irish hands who built this and designed it, I want to thank you, too, for all you've done and the way you lift people up. You really make a difference. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2022, Kennedy Center honorees, congratulations to you and your wonderful families. And thank you for showing us the power of the arts and we the people. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you.